Uh, I want to thank those who have been participating online. Obviously, we love you, we miss you, and we recognize that not all of you can gather with us just yet, uh, that your conscience might not allow it, uh, but you are absolutely valued members of our church family. Uh, we thank you for your prayers and encouragement, and I know that many in our community have been able to find times to connect elsewhere, or we've had life group running on Zoom every other week, and so uh, we miss you, and uh, please Take your time as you need to, uh, and we just thank you that you get to be a part of us in this way. Uh, so we've been going through the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11, and uh, we've seen the author hit a whole bunch of different individuals uh, from biblical history and how these individuals were commended for their faith, which just means to believe God, to trust the things that God says. Uh, and that these individuals, we see all of these different actions that they do as a result of their faith. And in his case, the author of Hebrews, uh, he's, he's kind of like running out of time or space. And at this point, he's just kind of like, ah, let me list off a bunch of other ones. But we're going to look a little bit at the life of Gideon specifically today uh, with a little bit more detail than the author of Hebrews gave him. But nonetheless, the summary that Hebrews gives us is valuable. And so here we go. Hebrews 11:32. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. And so it's almost as if, right, he's running out of time, couldn't fit all his sermon in, and he's like, rapid fire. I've been there. I've been there. Verse 33. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from death. And so that's our key text, and what we're going to try to do today is figure out which of these statements might the author of Hebrews been applying to Gideon, all right? I mean, even reading some of these as far as quenched flames of fire, escaped death by the edge of the sword, you might be thinking this is describing maybe Gandalf from Lord of the Rings, but no, I, it, we, some of these describe Gideon, though. Here we go. So I'm going to do my best. Everett's going to put on a summary verse. Uh, with 32, 33, and 34, where I think these relate to Gideon. So here we go. Recount the stories of the faith of Gideon. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and perceived what God had promised them. And as far as ruled with justice, I want to point out that Gideon was one of the judges in the book of Judges, that this was a time period before the kings uh, and so this was times in which God would raise up an individual who would interpret the law for the people and literally be a judge in difficult cases in which, right, claims of injustice were brought to them. But also they were at times a prophetic individual or even a warrior that would bring about God's justice and desire for the land. And so Gideon, I think, would, yes, have ruled with justice. And he received what God had promised him that God promised that he would be a deliverer, as we will see, and he sees the fruit of that promise come into action, uh, and right that God keeps that end of the promise. We'll read more about that detail in, in future weeks about Gideon. And in verse 34, the most significant concept for today's sermon is that their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. And so what I want to highlight today for us is that it is a regular characteristic of God to take those who are weak and display his glory through them, not for the sake of their own fame, but that the name of God would be made famous, that God is able to use those who are humble and use them for his glory. And we would agree that, right, in, in the case of those who are sometimes strong, they can be full of pride because of their abilities, and that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. In fact, in Psalm 37, the psalmist talks about God meeting him in a place of weakness and giving him strength. He says this, uh, My health may fail and my spirit may grow weak, 
but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. And so God is one who meets us in our places of weakness, who meets us when we don't have every aspect of our lives together. And God gives us strength, but we must remain with him and in him in order to enjoy that strength. So let's go to Judges chapter 6. We'll, where we'll read a little bit of the, the story of this moment. We're just going to focus on God's visiting Gideon. And we watched a little bit of a video at the beginning of the sermon. I'll post the link uh, below. But uh, this, the scriptures go into a little bit more detail. Uh, Judges 6.1. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. Let's pause there already. Now, when last we were looking at the biblical story, we were reading about Joshua and, and coming into the promised land, this land that was full of milk and honey, and you might think like, oh, finally, everything's going to go great from here on out. And yet that is the opposite experience that sadly the very nation of Israel that had inher inherited the land that God promised Abraham hundreds of years prior, they were oftentimes a wicked people. And as written here, they did evil in the Lord's sight. And I want to point out, it's the Lord's sight that is really the only sight that matters when it comes to good and evil. All right? Because even Gideon, I might suggest, he might not have been fully aware of how wicked his nation's deeds were at the start. But it doesn't matter how we perceive things, it's God's sight, God's justice and judgment that matters. And so Israel did evil in the Lord's sight, and God hands them over to the Midianites, who oppress them. And this language is actually a type of judgment that God does frequently throughout the Scriptures, even in the New, Te New Testament. In Romans chapter 1, when, we when those suppress the truth and unrighteousness, when they repeatedly resist God and deny the evidence of the Creator in the world that He's made, He eventually turns them over to depraved minds into their own sins. That it's, it's a judgment of almost, as Gideon's going to say, abandonment, where God just steps back, withholds and removes his blessing, and lets them experience the full fruit of their sin. So let's keep reading. Verse 2. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east would attack Israel, uh, camping in the land and destroying the crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, and cattle and donkeys. These enemy hordes coming with their livestock and tents were as thick as locusts. They arrived on droves of camels, too numerous to count, and they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So, Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then, the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. And so this is one of the things that's interesting, a rhythm that's on display in the book of Judges, and even throughout the scriptural narrative as a whole, where the people did evil in the Lord's sight, uh, that God turns them over to their own sin, Eventually, right, they call out to God for help. He helps them, delivers them, rescues them. They repent of what they did, right? And they, they start to follow God for a season. And then as life gets better and comfortable and convenient, they turn back to living for themselves, their own sin, and worship idols. And this rhythm is sad. It's, it's grievous, right? It's heartbreaking. And yes, I would admit that yes, this happens in the lives of individuals, right? Perhaps even we at times have gone through seasons where we're on fire for God, we're chasing after Him, and then other times we just kind of, right, fade out of that for a little bit. It waxes and wanes, and, and we might pursue our own things and build our own kingdoms for a little bit until that gets wrecked, and we go back to God for help, right? And He was there and available the whole time, but it's one of the things that we have in our own hearts, this temptation to focus on our own lives. And you might even think about the prodigal son, that that's a narrative that describes that same exact rhythm. But in this case, 
It's not just the rhythm within an individual, but it's on the macrocosm of a generational waxing and waning of the people of God. In fact, uh, Everett, you can leave the slide there, but I want to just highlight a handful of verses and show the length of time that God allowed these seasons to be. In Judges 3.8, the Israelites served Cushan Rishathaim for eight years. And then in Genesis 3.11, there was peace in the land for 40 years. In Judges 3.14, they served Eglon of Moab for 18 years. Judges 3.30, Moab was conquered by Israel, and there was peace in the land for 80 years this time. In Judges 4.3, they were ruthlessly oppressed for 20 years by Sisera. And then in Judges 5.31, there was peace in the land for 40 years. And then we just read the verse, Judges 6.1, that God handed the Israelites over to the Midianites for seven years. And after the life of Gideon, after Gideon is faithful to obey God for the remaining portion of his life, that there is peace in the land for 40 years. And so I want to point out that these time periods are long, but it seems as though each generation has opportunity to repent at any time, and each generation has opportunity where there's a season of of revival almost that occurs within their own generation, where they might turn to God or the nation comes back to God and seeks Him and comes to Him and He delivers them and rescues them. But this happens on a generational level. That this is the way that God has worked with his people for time and time and time again. And that every time, even in the seasons in which there is a waning, that there is always a remnant that God works with. That there is always a people that he remains faithful to and they remain faithful to him. And that they don't rebel with the rest of the nation of Israel. And so as far as the what's happening at this time, Gideon doesn't fully understand it, all right? But this, the author of the book tells us why. Why is Midian doing this? It's because God handed them over because of Israel's own sins. Let's go to verse 7, Everett. And so when they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. And so God sends them a message. Now they're, they're praying to God, they're seeking God, And the the prophet shows up and says, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. And I told you, I am the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live. But you have not listened to me. And so after seven years of oppression, the Israelites cry out to God for help, and he gives them a message, and it's not the message that they'd wanted to hear, right? He's like, but I want you to fully understand, this is why this is happening in your generation and at this time, right? You refused to listen to my instruction and to obey my commands. But nonetheless, God isn't done. He doesn't just simply say, I told you so, and then leave it at that. Check out verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezer. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of the winepress to hide the grain from the Midianites. And so Gideon is there. He's threshing wheat. He's hiding because he's worried about it getting stolen or losing his life, as we saw in the video. And and he's hiding in a winepress. This isn't the place where you process wheat in this way. And yet this angel shows up because at this time, finally, the nation of Israel cries out to God for help. He tells them why they were experiencing their oppression, but now he is sending an angel to help them. And so verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And this is incredibly amusing based on the status of Gideon's life. Uh, that he, as he'll point out, has no strength in him, uh, that he is not a hero, uh, and and he doubts whether God is even with him, that he he disagrees with his entire statement. 
And this is what it says in verse 13. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. It's almost as though, right, like this is, this is crazy. Gideon is afraid of the Midianites, but he has almost no fear of this angel of the Lord showing up. Right? Like he, it's almost as though he's been threshing wheat in this wine press and just stewing and just angry. And he's like, man, if I had a chance to talk to God, I've got some questions for him. And the minute the angel shows up, he's like, excuse me, sir, I've got some questions for you. No doubt anywhere. Like, you come here, you got to report to me. Right? That Gideon has all of these accusations against God and what this angel claims about him. He asks the question, why has this happened to us? And he concludes that God has abandoned us because this has happened to us. Gideon is wrong in his theology here. That he believes that like, if God was with us, if God were real, he wouldn't have allowed any of this to, to happen in my life. That he doubts the existence or the presence of God at the least with the people of Israel. That he does not think God is actually with them. He, he's, he's coming at God with the accusation of why do you allow suffering in this world? Right? And, and he might, in his mind, not think that Israel's really done all that much wrong. He might be so established and ingrained in the culture of their sin and evil, as was described in verse 1, that he might, not be like, he might just be like, I don't understand, God, we're all pretty good people around here. Like, why is this happening to us? Right? But God is going to flip this question on Gideon. That Gideon is asking God, why has this happened to us? God is going to essentially ask the question, why will you allow it to continue to happen? Right? Like, are you going to do nothing about this yourself? Because God is going to call Gideon to be a part of the solution to this problem. Gideon asks the question, where are all the miracles? And at his time and his generation, apparently, there weren't drastically visible signs of God showing up. There wasn't a pillar of cloud and fire. There wasn't the Red Seas being parted. And he doubts God because he only sees the natural world around him that's full of suffering. That he doubts, he's like, listen, my ancestors tell me about miracles, but I haven't seen one. And we, and we see this even throughout different generations in the scriptures. In 1 Samuel, it says that a word from the Lord was rare in those days. That there are moments in which God's Spirit does not seem to be moving a whole lot. But yet it's not reason for us to just like sit back or accuse God of maybe not existing at all. Or it's like, God, it's not the way I see it in the book when I'm looking around in my life. No, as I would said earlier today, right? Paul teaches us to desire to seek after the spiritual gifts. That we should be a people who pray to God, or as the Israelites finally were here seven years in, crying out to God for help. Right? That this is something that we can seek after, that we can desire, that we can grow in, and the Holy Spirit shows up and gives these giftings as He wills. All right, but Gideon, nonetheless, he's coming at this from a naturalistic mentality where he's like, I don't see any miracles. I don't see God showing up. I see a whole lot of suffering in my life. And he concludes that the Lord has abandoned us. Right? He's built his case. He's like, listen, if, if, if God is with us, why has this happened to us? No, 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 no. Let me tell you, God has abandoned us. But he hasn't. The people of Israel had abandoned God. And they finally cry out to God, and God is showing up. As if he's been waiting there like the father of the prodigal son the whole time. Right? And that finally they come back. It's not that God had abandoned them. They had left God. But what's interesting is one of the things that Gideon states was true. He said that the Lord had handed them over to the Midianites. And that's one thing that the Scriptures already confirmed in verse 1. God did allow the Midianites to oppress Israel for seven years. That was something that was true. 
And so what's interesting, Gideon asks all these questions and God doesn't really answer necessarily all of them. He just gives Gideon a mission. And in verse 14, then the Lord, the Lord turned to him, and this is actually interesting. I just want to point out, we've seen that this is an angel of the Lord, and now it's being described in the scriptures as the Lord. Okay? Uh, so the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. All right, go with the strength you have, is the way the New Living Translation says it. ESV says, go in this might of yours. And Gideon's going to point out that he doesn't have a lot of strength. But that's not a sufficient reason for excuse to say, well, I guess I, I shouldn't really do anything about this because whatever I could do is, is very little. And so I'm just going to choose to do nothing instead of even, yes, the little that I could do. But God instructs, go with the strength that you do have. Use the faith that you do have. Use the gifts that you do have. Use the scriptures that you do have knowledge of. Whatever little you think you have in any category, in any resource, in any spiritual maturity, you shouldn't just be like, well, I don't have a lot, so I'm going to do nothing. No, 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 no. Use the giftings that God has given you. Right? This is the same uh, accusation that Jesus makes in the parable of the ten coins, in which there's that one servant who had one coin, and he just hid it in a napkin and buried it in the dirt and did nothing with it. Right? And Jesus is like, like, that's a wicked servant. Use the gifts you have. Use the strength that you have, that God has given you. Yes, it may be little, but it is non-zero. And there's no excuse to, to produce not a, a zero amount of fruit, right? We can't just be like, well, it's not enough. I'm not going to get enough credit, so I'm not going to really try all that hard. No, no, no. Use the gifts that you have. Faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains. And you might be like, well, I don't think I really have all that much faith. No, use the faith that you have. Let's see. Let's continue. Verse 15. Now, now Gideon starts like backstepping. He's like, but, but, but Lord, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. And yet the angel of the Lord is, is introducing Gideon, like calling out to Gideon, mighty warrior. And Gideon's like, I'm the smallest, I'm the weakest, I'm from the weakest, smallest tribe, I'm the least, right? Like in every way, he's estimating that he is the the worst person to choose for this job, right? And, and he thinks that's sufficient excuse for he's like, well, no, this problem's too big and I'm too small, so I get to do nothing is what he would interpret that as. But that's not a sufficient excuse to the Lord. Verse 16, the Lord said to him, I will be with you and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. And so when Gideon asks the question, how can I rescue Israel? The answer to that one is, God will be with you, right? The same with the mission that Jesus gives to the church to go into all nations and make disciples, baptizing them in, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that he's commanded us. How, how can we accomplish that? Like Jesus, how can we have this multi-generational global movement in which we accomplish this task that you've given us. We can't do it on our own. The answer is that God will be with you, right? Lo, Jesus is with you even to the end of the age. And so that's the answer. That was the answer for Gideon as well. And so Gideon replied, okay, he's like, okay, if you are truly going to help me, show me a sign to prove it that it is really the Lord speaking to me. Don't go away until I come back and bring my offering to you. And he answered, I will stay here until you return. Gideon hurried home. He cooked a young goat with a basket of flour he baked with some bread and without yeast. Then carrying the meat in, in a basket and the broth in a pot, he brought them out and presented them to the angel who was under the great tree. The angel of God said to him, place the meat and the unleavened bread on this rock and pour the broth over it. And Gideon did as he was told. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and bread with the tip of the staff in his hand 
and flame, a fire flamed up from the rock and consumed all that he had brought. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. All right, so Gideon brings this offering. It's consumed in an offering of fire. And then like, it now suddenly clicks for Gideon. Verse 22. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he cried out, O oh, sovereign Lord, I am doomed. I have seen the face of the angel, or I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. That he's like, now he's suddenly panicked. He's like, oh shoot, I was just like back talking and the boss was there the whole time, right? Like, oh my goodness, I was accusing God of all of these things and it was God that was in front of me. I'm dead, I'm dead. And, and even though the angel of the Lord is already gone, it sounds like he's like shouting back as he's leaving. He's like, it's all right, the Lord replied. Do not be afraid, you will not die. And Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and named it Yahweh Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. The altar remains in Ophrah in the land of the clan of Abiezer to this day. All right, and so that's the narrative. That's the text that we're looking at. And obviously, there's all sorts of things that Gideon experienced that relate and are relevant to us. Things that we likewise experience. And, and one of the main themes that I want us to consider in our own lives is that God chooses weak people for great things. All right, and, and just as a justification, 2 Corinthians 12.9 this is the moment in which the Apostle Paul is praying to God about the thorn in his side, in his flesh. All right, and, and God's response is this, after Paul prays, I think, three times. Verse 9, each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. And so Paul says, I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. The ESV translation says, my power is made perfect in weakness. That when God chooses someone like Gideon, God gets all the credit. God's power is magnified. It's most on display when he uses someone who is weak. And Paul's now willing, instead of boasting of all of his credentials and all of his studies and all of his experience, he counts those things as rubbish. He's willing to acknowledge his own failures. He's willing to call himself the chief of sinners. And as a result, it puts God's grace on greater display because Paul's like, if God can forgive me, he can forgive you. If God can use me, he can use you. All right? And, and this is significant, that, that the way we find strength in the midst of our weaknesses is fully trusting in God, relying on God, leaning on God. The author of Hebrews, right, which we've been reading about, and is, he's kind of closing the chapter 11, and he's talking about that there were many whose weakness was turned to strength. In chapter 12, he says this, and I'm just skimming parts of chapter 12. 12.2. 12, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and now he is seated at the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. And so the author of Hebrews talking about our temptation to grow weary, our temptation to give up and surrender, one of the ways that we can endure, like Jesus endured, is considering the way he did that in the midst of all that hostility that he faced. That if we think about what Jesus went through, we can then also have strength to not grow weary and to not quit. All right, that yes, there will be times in which we feel weak, but we must rely on God's strength and remind us that if the Spirit was faithful to help Christ walk through all that he did through the crucifixion, then the Spirit will be faithful to work through us as well. Skip down to verse 10, and he's talking about God's correcting us. He says, For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us. Okay, right? So kids, dad doesn't always get it right, but God always gets it right. Okay? Uh, 
And the reason that this is good for us is that we might share in God's holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. And right, and think about the, the life of Gideon, which I've already summarized the end of the story, that after he's faithful to obey God, he experiences 40 years of peace in his life and in his entire community. That because he's willing to be trained by God, to follow God, God brings peace. And that for us, when we don't quit, when we don't grow weary in our fight against sin, as it said earlier in the chapter, then we can experience a season of peace, a harvest of peaceful living, right? Right living. That when we don't, aren't enslaved to sin, we can more fully enjoy the good things in this world that God has given us. That we're not enslaved to those things. We're not burdened by those things. We're not just stumbling every step of the way, screwing up our lives and bringing harm to ourselves and others. That we can start to really enjoy the good things that this life has. And so it is in trusting on God's strength that we're able to do that. Trusting in, yes, even God's correction that we're able to find strength and experience this peace. And so verse 12, it says, So take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Make out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. All right, and obviously this is hitting all of the language that we've had as a theme in the sermon, right? Like as far as, right, take a new grip with your tired hands, strengthen your weak knees, right? That those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. And sometimes when we're hearing the description or the benefit of what God is instructing us in the Word, we forget what He's actually instructing us. And so what he's actually saying here, how how do you do these things? How do you find new strength? And he says this, by making out a straight path for your feet. Right? That is, he said earlier, as God trains and instructs and disciplines us, that we respond to that instruction. That we endure as Jesus endured. And that we will find this kind of strength. That we must plan for our lives. We must plan on obeying God. We must aim to please God. And that that's the way we find strength in these moments. Let's see. I'm going to read it. Yeah, Isaiah 40. And actually, George, I saw you uh, just posted this on Facebook today. Here we go. Have you never heard, have you never understood, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on the wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. All right, that when we trust in the Lord, which is one of our definitions for faith, that as we've been studying Hebrews 11 and the lives of these individuals, faith is believing what God says, trusting in God to keep and fulfill His promises. And it's when we trust in Him to do the things that He said He will do, that's when we can find strength. That's when the God who is omnipotent, full of power, gives power to us in our times of weakness. That's when his, his strength is on fullest and perfect display, is when we are weak and rely and trust completely on him. Let's see, Isaiah 53. Now, not only is this something that God calls us to, but this is something that God loves us and cares for us. And the weakness described in this passage isn't talking about human weakness in terms of energy and exercise and that sort of weightlifting strength. But we, at a time, were weak in our sin. And prophetically speaking, hundreds of years before Jesus, this is what Isaiah prophesied. He said, yet it was our weakness that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. 
And so one of the reasons that Jesus came, one of the reasons that God stepped into his own creation, God incarnate became a man, the image of the invisible God walking on this earth, was to bear our weaknesses, to, to pay the penalty, to experience punishment for our sin, for our rebellion. Just like the nation of Israel had cycles of rebellion, so have we. And Jesus received the full penalty for our sin, for our rebellion. That's one of the things that Jesus came to do. And in his crucifixion, it's, it's perplexing, it's confusing, it seems like a contradiction. How could the most powerful being, God, omnipotent, come and die a death like that? It's baffling to us. And in 2 Corinthians 13, 4, Paul says, Although he was crucified in weakness, he now lives by the power of God. That the crucifixion is a moment that, that's, that's baffling to many. It's foolishness, right? It's, it's a stumbling block to many because they're like, why would God do that? That doesn't make sense. How is that a display of God's strength? And yet it is because God came to rescue us and experience the punishment for our sins so that we could be saved that he came to die in our place for our sins. And it looked like defeat in every regard. And yet, he was powerful and mighty. God's power was on display in raising Christ from the dead. God's power was on display in giving him victory over sin and death. God's power was on display in that as Jesus was risen, he would bring many sons to glory. That God demonstrated his greatest power perfected in every way in a moment that looked like weakness. And that's the way that God always works, and that's the way that he planned, yes, even salvation. And that's the way that God works in our lives as well. That it's not, he didn't choose us because we were mighty. He didn't choose us because of our wisdom or our intellect. He chose us and he works through us because we're humble and we rely on him, we trust in him. And that we're not willing to let our own pride and ego get in the way. That we're willing to seek God and to let Him be glorified. That we're willing to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and walk out the good works that He's called us to. That we might not be the, the greatest examples of humanity in all of the world, but our lives will demonstrate the goodness of God to all of creation as we are a light to this world. Here, let's pray. And we'll, uh, we'll get a couple more songs in. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you do mighty things through weak vessels, or you accomplish powerful things through moments that appear to be weakness. I thank you, Lord, that it baffles the wise, that it confounds them, that it puts to shame the mighty, that it puts to shame those who are full of intellect. But God, for you chose us of, of whom we were of, of no renown, and you use us, you saved us, you redeemed us when we were yet your enemies, when we were in a place of weakness. I thank you, God, that as people cry out to you for deliverance, that you answer. And Lord, I thank you as well that we are a part of that answer. We are a part of that rescue plan. That God, you don't simply show up and rescue without using human beings that are a part of your kingdom. I pray, God, that we would be faithful to step out, to use the strength that you have given us to be obedient to the call and the, and the purpose that you've placed before us. I pray, God, that we would recognize that the things that we see about us that appear to be suffering and things that ought not be would be things that you call us to be a part of solving that you would call us and equip us to, to step into those spaces to bring about freedom and life and forgiveness and mercy. That, God, that the things that sometimes grieve us the most might be evidence of what you're calling us to. And, Lord, I pray that you would use your people mightily. That, Lord, we might not be a people of great strength, but you are a God who is all-powerful. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.